All right. So I had this rookie in my crew named Sean Steven, and he was in his early 20s. And at the end of the season, I was just like, man, what was it like when Slave Lake burned down? And he said that he could see the fire across the street from his house. And he's like, Mom, I can see the fire coming. And she's like, no, Steven, finish the dishes. <laughs> and he was like, she's like, I haven't heard anything on the news or anything, so we're fine. He's like, but Mom, I can see the fire. She's like, Steven, finish the dishes, and then we'll leave. <laughs> Hey guys, what's happening? Welcome to Your Forest. I'm Matthew Kristoff, and today I have got a author on, Harold R. Larson. He wrote a book called Fire in the Eucalypse. He uh, fights fire currently and has for 19 years in Alberta, uh, part of a unit crew and I imagine a bunch of other crews on top of that. Um, he visited Australia in 2009 and he was there for February 7th, which was the Black Saturday fires there. Uh, one of the most deadly wildfires uh, occurrences that they had had to date. Uh, I think over 173 people lost their lives and a lot of communities. Uh, really horrible. But he, in the in the book, he talks about fighting fire in Australia, how it differs from Alberta, and just the the situation leading up to it and the event itself. So uh, it's a really really awesome book. I really enjoyed it. Really he really captured how it feels to be in a situation like that. And uh, yeah, I loved it. I think you guys will like it too. Uh, so yeah, I had Harold on. We talked about his book and comparisons between Alberta and uh, and, and Australia and just fire in general. Uh, for example, you know, the California fires, you know, are happening right now. Uh, lots of people are missing. A lot of lost lives. Really, really sad. Um, and unfortunately, I think that's kind of going to be the norm. It seems it seems that way anyways. It seems like these occurrences are happening more and more and more, and it's really sad. And unfortunately, with, you know, the current state of the climate and, and everything else, it just kind of looks like this is, you know, not the end of of what we're going to see about of these natural disasters. Anyways, uh, so Harold Larson was on, and then Jordan Sykes was on. Jordan is uh, another forester out of Alberta here. Uh, he's been involved in research in wildland firefighting. He was a wildland firefighter himself. Um, yeah, and he put me on to Harold. So I brought him on, thought it'd be cool to have the back and forth. It was awesome. Really enjoyed it. Great conversation. Um, we actually recorded this whole podcast once before this and I think I mentioned that in the recording, but we recorded it once before about two weeks ago and Windows 10 decided to restart. So I was super jacked about that. I was really, really exciting. I was happy. Yeah, no, definitely wasn't infuriated and wanted to strangle Windows. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this one turned out really, really good. So I uh, hope you guys like it. And uh, without any further ado, uh, let's do this thing. Yeah, this is actually, it's kind of crazy when you think about how timely this is to think about like for this book regarding, you know, like communities burning and then like California. Yeah, that's wild right now. Basically, you know, in flames, like there's, there's for sure dozens of people, like dozens of fatalities and like, I don't know how many buildings lost and stuff like that. So it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's just fascinating to see that this is going on like everywhere, right? Like you had like Australia for like was your experience and then here in Canada, we're having like BC and Alberta's had a bunch of stuff, California and then like everywhere. It just seems like it's it's unprecedented though, right? Like this is not, I don't think this is something that we've seen before to this extent. Like towns burning from wildfires consistently, right? Definitely not at this frequency for sure. Yeah. BC just had two really big seasons back to back, which has never really been seen that way before. As right. Well. It's yeah, crazy, crazy big seasons too. Like, yeah, but that's what I mean. Like, and there was towns burning there too, right? So that's what I mean. This is like I think Slave Lake burning in Alberta was like the first town to burn since like in recent memory, right? Like before since like the 30s or something like that. I think was the last one. But like, and then after that, like everything just started like falling apart. But but like for you, it happened way before then, right? It was the yeah 2009, 2009, 2009 yeah. yeah. So all right, well let's. Uh, so I guess let's explain to you guys. All right, I, just, I, just, I think I'm going to skip an intro. I'm not even going to do an intro. This will be the intro. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds so, good. So Harold Larson, uh, what do we call you? International firefighter and author supreme. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Jordan Sykes, what do you, what's what's your credentials? 
Uh, I <laughs> fought fire in Canada here with uh, Harold, and we did uh, three seasons together. I did five seasons here, but three of those I I did with Harold. And you and, from the university too here. Yeah, so. University of Alberta. I'm a forester. Yeah, and. Uh, I've been with, uh, CIF, Canadian Institute of Forestry. Yeah, doing I'm, stuff for them. I'm working a lot with CIF these days. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So what's? Uh, I was thinking of like a million different ways to try and start this, and I could not come up with anything creative whatsoever. So like, we're just going to start talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Yeah, that works. That's easy. <laughs> Last time, yeah, we recorded this once before, but that's Windows 10's fault for updating. <laughs> God, I still can't believe we lost a whole hour. Man, that's frustrating. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> we got lots to talk about, so we need more than one hour. <laughs> um, okay, so maybe let's let's start it off with uh, like how like what got you into fire, anyways? Because you're still fighting wildfire now, right? Yeah. So so you've been doing it for how long? Uh, Nineteen years. Nineteen years. How old are you, man? I'm, thir- I'm thirty-five. So when I was sixteen, <laughs> okay. When I was sixteen, I was I lived on a farm and I was working um, as a farmhand and it was all right. But my buddy said we should apply for a contract fire crew in Kamloops. We did, and it was like a three day course. And then that uh, summer between grade eleven and twelve, I went to the states for forty days to fight fires in Washington. Man, that's awesome! You must have been loaded when you got back to school. Yeah, for sure. I bought a truck and I bought a uh, suit for grad. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. That's so funny. It's great for a 16 year old. Yeah, they did five years in BC contract, then I got on with the Alberta government. I've been working with them ever since. Right. And then, so, yeah, what year was uh, the Black Saturday fires again in Australia? It was 2009. 2009. Yeah. So, this whole book was regarding your whole trip to Australia in 2009. Yeah. And uh, so, how old were you when you went down there? I just turned 25. Okay, so you've been fighting fire for a while already. So, you, yeah. were, you were a veteran, like, you're used to fire behavior and, like, it's not like, yeah, it's not, you don't get the, you know, the adrenaline rush that you do as like a rookie or something like that where. Yeah. It's a little bit harder to get. Now. Yeah. 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 Um, so how do we want to start this? I'm thinking like, what, what was the motivation to go to Australia anyways? how did you, how did you come well, around to that I'd, decision? Like you did hell attacks, you know what it's like for a lot of guys. They do a lot of work in the summer, then they make a good bunch of money. Then you want to travel in the wintertime. Mm-hmm. And I was going to go to Australia anyway. So oh, I, had, I see. Right. So, so, I had, so I had my visa and I had everything already in place. And then my buddy did it the year before. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you should apply. And he put the good word in for me. And it actually like happened really smoothly. And So basically you fought fire all year round because their seasons are opposite to ours, right? Because they're yeah. in the Southern Hemisphere. So you were fighting. So you finished fire in October or something like that. And then went straight to Australia and, and fought their I, summer. Then I started in December, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, sweet. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating difference between... You know, between fighting fire here and fighting fire there, right? Like, it's just, just like, it seemed like even reading the book, like the one thing that I thought you did really well in the book was explaining how firefighting works and kind of the, like the camaraderie and just like the, you, you, you captured the vibe really well. You know oh, what I mean? Thanks. Like that's, that was the big thing that I gathered was that <clears throat> it, it brought me back to like when I was fighting fire, right? I was like, yeah, that is exactly like that. Like those little, little details of like. I can't even explain it, but the camaraderie and the and just the the vibe you get from fighting fire, like being in this intense situation with like a bunch of people or a group of people for like four or five months, right? And you really develop like all these relationships and like yeah, you bond to them, bond with them big time. Like it becomes your family, right? And at one point in the book, you even said, um, like during the Black Saturday fires, after like some build, some towns had burned down and some, some you've been in some crazy situations. You said something about I'm trying to remember now, um, like everything else melted away. Like the rest of life, when you're in that situation, working like 18, 20 hour days for like two weeks on end, everything else melts away, and all you're thinking about is like that. That's your family right now. That's who you're thinking about. That's who you're concerned about. And like, it does. It almost seems unreal, right? Like you forget that you have a life in Canada or whatever, right? And yeah. I, I, I could, I could relate to that from the like from the Slave Lake fire. So it's kind of similar situation. I mean, Slave Lake was my home, but it was still, I'd forgotten about the rest of my life, right? Like everything a bit became about like those people and like that situation. So that like really, I thought you did a good job with that. It was good. Thank you. Yeah. yeah it's difficult when you get in those, those situations or especially over an uh, extended period of time because you don't really have a lot of time to focus on anything else. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you're going to be pretty useless at what you're doing. So you pretty much have to focus on what you're doing at the time. Yeah, no, for sure. And it just, it's all encompassing. Right, I like I, um, I talked to another Canadian who fought fire here, and and we've worked with a lot. And he's gone and traveled down to Australia, 
and spoke with a lot of the people you talk about in the book and asked them for their account. And he told me that what he found interesting is some will talk about the fire and some don't talk about it like it happened at all. So what was that like for you um, writing afterwards and going back and talking to those people later? When Well, for, well, for me, like when I went through that um, fire, I didn't really talk about it after for a couple of years because there's no one really wanted to... Um, I didn't really have anyone back home that really could relate to it mm-hmm. or really want to talk about it. Plus, I was a bit younger. I just had other things going on. I guess I didn't really see the value in it as I do now. But uh, when I went back to Australia five years later, I was 30. And yeah, like all the guys that I worked with like didn't bring it up once or really even want to talk about it. And like some guys I tried to interview and talk about it, but... Uh, for like the ex- book. Yeah, yeah, for the book. And I even just as like on a personal basis, right? Because mm-hmm. a lot of them have kids and like they're, they're family men now and you think yeah. that they'd want to get into it, but... Yeah, like one of the guys I worked with, his name was Sam Kidd, and he did an interview with everybody to kind of figure out like the timeline of what happened that day. And like everybody had a different account or timeline in their head is what happened. So everyone's memory gets shaped differently over time, or especially like during those um, extraordinary circumstances where like a lot of things are happening. Yeah. So yeah, I think we should, uh, we should, we should get into, before we get too far down the line, let's talk about like Black Saturday, like the situation, like the environmental situation coming into that that day and like the fire situation and just kind of like just try to paint a picture of how like so people can understand how severe the situation was like going into the fires actually starting yeah no problem so when i first got to australia they i arrived in melbourne which is on the coast and it was kind of rainy but then i went like an hour and a half inland into uh in the state of victoria to a town called alexandra and that was my home base right and it hadn't really rained a lot in the previous eight years there it was an eight year drought so like the they had a lake there called lake yielden and normally it's at 90 percent holding capacity but it got down to 10 so we we're actually having to uh mitigate water having only four minute showers um different things like that so drought codes were um maxed out there's no such thing as crossover there. They don't talk about it because every day is crossover, so that doesn't mean anything to them. Let's explain what that is because a lot of people listening probably won't know what crossover is. Right. So crossover is a term that we use, particularly in Canada, a lot is when um, the relative humidity goes lower than the temperature in Celsius. And once you have that, that pretty much makes everything want to burn at a very volatile state. Right. So yeah, just, in Canada, especially like when you're on man up or hell attack, mm-hmm. you hear it's crossover today, you know if something happens, it's going to go. You're going to be making money today. Yes. <laughs> be working yeah the boys like the boys like crossover there's definitely sure. gonna be a lot of overtime for sure but in australia every day is crossover like that's yeah. not even something they talk about it's a wildly volatile situation here you might see it five times a summer depends on the year obviously right in alberta yeah. i would say bc, yeah, southern it's, more BC common. it's probably all the time all right? the time yeah right. well i think it's po- important to point out that like the crossover situation is a situation in which basically fire behavior indexes go out the window Basically, you're just like, yeah, no, this is going to be hot and fast and crazy, and we don't know what it's going to do. Yeah, if there's any just, ignition source, it's you basically go. lose all control of mm-hmm. what's going to happen, right? Like if it's if it gets up into the crown and takes off, you've got a wildfire that's out of control. And I think that's that's one of the weird things that, like, I've had some emails recently from from people from listeners that really know nothing about forestry or like environmental sciences or wildfire or anything. So I'm trying to make it so that people can follow along, right? And I think that's one thing about wildfire that people that, that's a bit of a misconception so like even in california I've been, I've been kind of following that a little bit and you see you see a lot of public being outraged at why they have like why firefighters haven't taken care of this like why isn't there more government or even trump like you listen to trump talking about like i blame this on x y and z right blaming it on, on the firefighters and stuff like that and but, but he has a basic like he has no idea what he's talking about right yeah how like could they, he you can't well, no you can't he can't but I'm, but it's like, whatever anyways i don't want to get down <laughs> that road but basically what i'm saying is i think it's hard for people to recognize they don't most of the public doesn't see wildfire like a like a, a large intense wildfire as like you would see like a hurricane or something like that like an unstoppable force of nature right they see it as like well there's they have planes and they have helicopters and they have trucks and they they should be able to stop this somehow and it's like i don't think people fully grasp how unstoppable those things are because like when you get a fire definitely don't that's that big and it's it's you know what i mean it's shooting flames hundreds of feet into the air and it's you've got wind that's blowing it and preheating fuels a kilometer ahead of it because it's it's burning so hot 
then you've got a situation that's basically uncontrollable, right? Like it's there's there's nothing you can do except you can maybe try to aim it and try to put out like really what what we're doing is trying to put out like the flank and the back of the fire really in those situations because at least if the the air you know what I mean like if the wind shifts we don't have something going off in another direction but that's like realistically what else can we do you can't yeah, really the, the, ground the head crew. of the fire in that situation right no one gets sure. to a certain stage of involvement now no so it's and I think that's a huge misconception that a lot of the public has is that like well the firefighters should be in there and they should be taking care of that and they should but that's not what we do because it's not effective no. and it puts people in danger and it put, it's just like it's a bad situation right no so, when you see those like big flames up high and like tankers dropping on them the only ground crew that are touching that are, are at the back of it cleaning it up as mm-hmm. the thing roars up ahead of them yeah basically it's the only safe place to work on the ground right, so exactly. yeah I don't think that people understand that or see that either they just see they just assume that everyone's up there just blasting it with water trying to hold it but yeah. there's no way you can't even move as fast as that thing's moving but if you tried to like I, even even i feel like well even the, like a lot of the tankers that are dropping on those fires they're dropping retardant and stuff like that they're not dropping water because by the time the water reaches where the fire is like it's already evaporated it's oh, so yeah, hot it's not, it, it does ground. nothing it's completely useless right like it's so when they're dropping loads they're dropping it on less intense areas to try and just snuff those out to like reduce spread, but it's not the head of the fire that's actually like burning through everything, right? It's well, and 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 the head of the fire is jumping kilometers at it. It's spotting, so sending brands like a kilometer ahead and reigniting. So it's moving yeah. at such a fast rate that even a retardant line is not going to stop a one one kilometer no. jump. And and then, then they jump way more than that too. Well, I'm sure further. you have like crazy stories about like jumping from like spot fire to spot fire, even just here in Alberta, right? Like I, I personally, I remember a day we did seven different spot fires in one day. Oh yeah, off of a yeah. big, off of it wasn't even that big. It was, I think, it was like maybe like thirty hectares or something like what that. What were the fuels but, like there for spotting and like what? What? How did fire burn there? You have a different forest in Australia. Yeah, for sure. So it's when I went there, I was a little bit ignorant to it. I thought all firefighting was the same, but obviously it's on the other side of the world, so it's going to be different there. So they use different tools, different tactics, um, different um, equipment. So the fuel there is mostly eucalyptus trees, so they're a lot more oily. Um, they're more um, used to getting fire, so they've evolved to burn a lot. So mm-hmm. the bark on it is actually really stringy, and it's loose. So and it's actually kind of hard to. And then when it gets on fire, it's going to get into the wind, and it spots like kilometers away. So it's not like it's like a pine cone or a needle. It's actually something that can hold embers, right? And and spot like way ahead of the fire. It's kind of like it's kind of like birch bark in a way. I guess like people can probably yeah, relate that, to that's birch a good bark. way. A right? harder version of birch bark I guess. but also more flaky than that even yeah right? and, it's, it's, and it's all around the bark from top to bottom yeah so it's more likely a, to that's light. a stringy bark eucalypts but there's a ton of different species right right um and then the undergrowth um a lot of it's bracken um nothing really substantial in like the mineral soil or like the duff layer mm-hmm. so a lot of our tactics is using rake hose which is um a shovel that's kind of it's kind of like a shovel but it's more like a rake with um like a 12 inch blade on the bottom and you use that and you dig away the fuel and you do handguard. Like in Alberta, we got muskeg, so there's no point in doing a handguard because you're not going to be able to dig through it. But there you can just dig straight down to sand or mineral soil right. and uh, make a fuel guard that way. And muskeg you, here goes like meters deep. You can't, so yeah. no, you can't get rid of the organic. So the basic idea is just going down to mineral soil, removing the stuff that can burn. Right? Let's but talk it, about those layers quick. The, you're talking about the duff, <laughs> how deep the duff is, and then going down to below that, which is your mineral. So like yes. the duff will so, burn. So, so there, there's, there's no duff. There's nothing. There's just uh, like mineral soil with like stuff growing out of it. Right. So the only layer is like leaf litter. So the du- oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So you're not you're not getting like you're not getting the like high high severity burns, I guess, where you're burning deep because there is nothing to burn deep into. Just into root systems, maybe, but right. yeah, nothing like that. Yeah. Okay. So and there's also there's no water there. I took that for granted too. Like Alberta, we have pump and hose. And that's our main tactic to fight fires. There, they don't have water sources, so we don't carry around portable hose or portable pumps. Like when I was went there my second time, I found like an old Mark III that was probably eighty years old, and they didn't really even know like how to use it or what it was for. So, do, do they have like portable pumps at all? Just on their trucks. Just oh, just on the but just on the truck. They're like not something that like they don't expect to find a water source somewhere where they. They, can they don't even have wayjack bags or piss packs as we call them. So the right. truck is the water source. The truck is the water source. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's not a lot of water. No, so like we your, definitely take that for granted in Alberta. Our fire engines we use there were V8 Land Cruisers, which are sweet because you can go anywhere because a lot of it's uh, trail um, driving. Mm-hmm. And you can, it's like 300 gallons, which isn't really a lot to suppress the fire. So fast. fast. So fast. Then the bigger trucks are about three or four thousand maybe five thousand but even that isn't a lot to, it's not going to put out a forest right it's going to stop from burning out infrastructure or something but mm-hmm. yeah definitely water is a secondary mean of um 
action there unlike here where it's our our main main force yeah you got to deal with the situation that you've been given right like yeah, exactly. just throw sand at it until it goes out <laughs> back burning is actually the tactic they, they use a lot back burning so, yeah so okay. a lot of dozer groups a lot of making um guards or established lines away from the main fire yeah and then having firefighters line up on that with the trucks and then burning off that main line towards the main fire so and basically that. find a fire just i'm just trying to explain what you're like so like finding a fire like a, a fuel break like a road or a dozer, a dozer guard, which has gone down to mineral soil, yeah. and then burning from there towards a fire. And the yeah. idea is that the the main fire will be pulling in oxygen, so pulling the 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 what do you call it the the back burn back burn. Yeah, I was having a brain fart there, uh, <laughs> pulling the back burn towards it. Right, so that's then you eliminate the fuels between the main fire and where you are, right? And that creates the, your break for you. Yeah, and that's and that's like so you guys did a lot of that then. That, hey? That's like their main tactic. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Okay, so like they're they're well seasoned in back burning and like we we don't like I don't I don't remember doing a ton of that in Alberta. Like in, I don't, in Northern Alberta, it doesn't really help a lot because of the yeah. way our fuels are there. It's like so flashy and it can burn through and it's not going to burn deep. That it's a it's a it's a really good tool here. A lot of times it creates a lot more work yeah. than mm-hmm. is necessary for northern Alberta anyway. Grass, right. it's really good, but in Muskeg and stuff, we don't really use it a lot because it's not really the best tactic to use. Well, yeah, because here it just burns. Everything burns deep and, and, and for a long time, right? We're there. Yeah. It seems like it's flashy and, there's water. and dangerous. Yeah. And we have water. water. We have water. water. Yeah, we have there's water. Always water. <laughs> there's always like an unlimited supply of water within a kilometer of. Oh, for sure. Of any fire, really. I don't and know. Usually like, it's not even that far away at all. Well, I don't know what you guys usually use for uh, for a pump, but like, like when I was doing wild or wildland firefighting, we always did. Uh, we always had to have the floto pump. Yeah, you're slave. So yeah, literally just slave. Like slave. slave. I don't know why we're so big on that, but like yeah. it's literally just the a musk pump. Eggs. Yeah, that's what it is. It's literally just a pump that's put on. It has basically pontoons on both sides, right? And then you just clear out a spot in the muskeg as long as you have if it's in a muskeg where you have constant feed of like groundwater coming in it just you can just put it in like six inches of water and it'll pump water all day long it's ridiculous it works so well I, I, but i found it interesting that slave lake was like one of the only places that did that everyone else was laughing at oh, the floto yeah. pump right <laughs> i've but, heard other guys like uh brett you've had brett on there too before i've heard him talking all about the flotos brett before. casey brett yeah. casey yeah no, we used uh, up in peace. We always use the Mark III and the uh, Mini Striker. But anyway, it's I never actually. I don't think I've ever actually started a Mini Striker except in members course. <laughs> great, great pump. <laughs> yeah, they're great for actioning like hot spots that are pretty far away from there that are small. Right, know? right, yeah. right. Lots of yeah. Yeah. Anyways, back to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So you're, you're talking about Australia, how they fight fire there. It's all backburns and getting rid of fuel, no water. Um, so. I wanted to get into the actual, like, the drought event. Right. Right? So, like, you were, it was... Eight years of drought. Eight years. And that was, that's not common, right? No. Yeah. So, like, usually, what, what, like, what, do they expect to have, like, a year of drought? Does that happen sometimes? Or is this... I I, I I, think they're expected to have, like, a one or two years, but, like, eight years was pretty... Okay. Unreal for them. Right. So, they're, they're getting worried, for sure. So, basically, everything is, everything's brown... There's not a lot of like green leaves except for. It kind of reminded me of Kamloops, actually. Of Kamloops? <laughs> <laughs> well, Pine Beetle kind of took care of all the, the yeah. greenness there, but it's right, kind of what right. it reminded me of. Like everything was pretty dull. So everything's just, there's no green, really. Not really. Yeah. So eucalypts are pretty drought resistant, pretty drought hardy, but everything else is hurting for when, sure. When you went back, when you were working on the book and did your next, was that five years later? Yeah. Uh, did, had the drought lifted? Had yeah. It, cha- okay. it, it lifted that, the, the season after that. Was it noticeable when you went back? Oh yeah, the vegetation. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So how it, it is would it changed? Uh, it's just more green. Like the bracken on the, it's kind of like this fern-like shrub that grows. It was a lot more. Isn't numerous. Um, there's a lot more um, fauna, like kangaroos and stuff. They're actually living in the town and things like that. Mm. Kangaroos were doing well. So it was basically Nowhere. just the desert <laughs> when you were there. Yeah. The first time, I mean. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. And so, like the water restriction that that was in there the first time wasn't there the second time I was there. Oh okay. Yeah, because you had yeah you said you were you were limited to like two four minute showers or something like that while you were yeah there? there's a little hourglass in my shower I had to turn and then when it ran out Man. and even if I tried to sneak if an extra minute my roommates would be banging on the door saying stop it what's the what's the <laughs> like like average like what's the temperature we're talking about here during the day like peak temperature average during the day so the two weeks leading up before it didn't get below twenty degrees mm-hmm. Celsius yeah Celsius yeah and the three days before the four days before it was over forty degrees during the daytime during the day so what's was, that that's like a hundred degrees Fahrenheit or something ridiculous right I think that's like a I don't even I know. think it's more than that I don't know my Fahrenheit to be yeah honest. I'm not, I don't know my Fahrenheit times either. two plus thirteen or plus thirteen times two or something but whatever yeah but yeah <laughs> but the day the day that it happened I think it was a record breaking event 
and it was the hottest I forget the exact number, but it was like 44 degrees. Yeah. And I was on my day off. Well, I was on call, but I was at home and like there's I had no air conditioning, so I was just like in struggle town on my couch trying to figure <laughs> it out. Struggle town. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's a it's a wild like I mean, there's so many communities now across the world now that are that have have this same situation where like an unprecedented weather event or weather a climate event where there's a drought or there's whatever going on and then unprecedented fuel build up and then unprecedented like lightning or like fuel like fire starts that burn through towns and cities right so like that's what happened in australia and mm-hmm. it's and that was that might have been one of the like early warning signs of what's like what's to come in like this side of the world even right like with oh definitely yeah. and for there like there's no reason why we shouldn't expected that to happen but no one was talking about it no one was really because the last fires that happened that were really bad was in 1983 mm-hmm. and that was the ash wednesday fires and that killed uh like 75 people and then the next big fire before that in australia was 1939 right and that so like no one was really it's not like today where it's happening all the time people are like prepared for it mm-hmm. like it hadn't happened in like 30 years right so i think there's kind of a complacency that was there yeah well How- just not even complacency just kind of unaware like not even it's not even on your radar right like no one was even, even talking about it like, yeah you don't even you don't even know that that's a possibility how caught up how caught off guard were you guys when <clears throat> that fire came through in marysville like were you watching it for a few days no it, it all happened that day like i was i'd been on like one or two small fires that happened like how long have you been fires? there already you've been there a month or two uh, december so and it was february so like two and a half months so two and a half months and you haven't had a ton of action maybe two small fires okay maybe that were just we were able to put on a day no i went to one that was like it took us three days okay but like yeah i didn't think it like a, a life-changing event was going to happen for sure like right. i was just that so was you're, like you're day. sitting at home how did you put it what was the word you said struggle town struggle town <laughs> <laughs> trying to cool off grabbing whatever ice or whatever you got to cool yourself off and then uh you get a call that there's a fire started near Marysville. Well, right? they didn't even say get to Marysville. I think they just said there's fires going on. Get to the depot right away. Okay. Depot's like what they call their base. Right. And we had an older guy named Kevin Hedger that was kind of in charge of all of us. Mm-hmm. And he'd been fighting fires for like 50 years. Like most of the guys there, they were a lot older than me. I was one of the younger guys, even mm-hmm. at 25. And uh, yeah, I said get to the base. So I jumped on this bike that they're given to me and it took me like 10 minutes in the heat to get to the base. Well, they gave you the bike to get to the base. Well, one of, one of the fellow firefighters. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> I was walking every day. So he gave me this pink bike actually. And, nice. Yeah. Tassels? <laughs> no. <laughs> but there's probably bad. a little bell on it. <laughs> yeah, basket. basket. I had to give it back when I was done actually. <laughs> nice. So, yeah. yeah, keep going. Yeah, so then we got there and there's a bunch of other fires going on. So they actually yeah. sent the more senior guys that were on call to this mill fire and it's called the Marindindi mill, I think it was called. So then when I got there, there was a hand, uh, I think it was maybe 16 of us, but we were all rookies or foresters. Like, uh, the foresters there get trained, uh, to fight fires in circumstances when it's emergencies. So it was just, um, a bunch of us going, not, not really a lot of experience, maybe two or three guys that had some experience in Australia, but not a lot. So it's a small crew already. Like you're, you're yeah, not, it's all, you have a ton of resources going towards this, fire that's headed towards a town yeah yeah and we all work in groups of two in trucks actually i think i was in a it's like a hilux it's kind of like their um it was a truck that held four people in it and it wasn't a firefighting truck and uh-huh. we were just sent there as like extra resources in that section so the hilux yeah that's those are only in like south america and like australia and yeah they're sweet they're yeah. sweet little trucks i don't know why we don't have them here and the land cruisers too those were toyotas uh well they're land cru- yeah toyota land cruisers yeah yeah all right Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they like they, they, they like Toyota and hold in there for sure. Yeah, so yeah. so this situation, like you guys have, you guys are going into a situation not knowing that this is like you know that there's a fire heading towards a town. We can we actually but, see the plume of smoke coming from Marysville, which is about a thirty minute drive from where we are. So we knew it was pretty substantial right. before we even got there. I'm gonna get that photo from you actually, and that's what I'm gonna use for. I'll use for promotional purposes for this. Okay, right on. I think that's a good one to do. It's actually in the book too, in the middle. Yeah, it's in the book. That's yeah, right. Yeah yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we'll we'll do that if that's cool with you. Yeah, for sure, man. I'll yeah. send you a couple. Yeah. When I when I went <laughs> when I went and visited the year, Harold went back and I, I visited for a few weeks. A local who had been working for the government at the time, she took me on like a drive and a tour of Marysville. And one thing I thought was really unique, she showed me like where the fire came over the mountain, <clears throat> and the town is like right in like a bowl. Like it's like very close to like the edge of a high sort of mount. I don't 
it's not like a rocky mountain, but it's like you know, it's in the mountains. It's in sure. the mountains, and yeah. and you can see that the the town is just sitting in a bowl, and you cannot see anything around the town outside of that bowl okay. because it's over top of it. You know, it's almost like being if you could if you could say like Canmore with the mountains right beside it to the south. And the entire like that. area but even is tighter, forested even tighter. mature eucalypts. So you're surrounded it feels really by, tight. You're surrounded by oily trees ready to burn. Yeah. <laughs> with, with, with houses yeah. built into the forest around it. Awesome. Yeah. And it's not rocky at all. The tops of the mountains are green yeah. all the way there's up. No, so there's whatever no fire smart. Up. There's no nothing. Like, right. Yeah. So this is a, a volatile situation. You guys are going in understaffed. Like, so like what's so, – so, okay. You get, like, so you're, you're heading that way, and there's a – like how, how big of a – plume of smoke are we talking about here like the biggest i've ever seen yeah so apocalyptic level yeah like it doesn't yeah. even look like smoke it looks like clouds right it's just covering everything you can see what yeah. color is it it's 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 actually it, it was white like it wasn't like the classic copper of like a lot of fuel brewing it was mm-hmm. it was actually just like pure white like a cloud well i think when it gets up into the i don't i'm gonna screw up i don't know what the word is but the not the stratosphere, but whatever that layer is where it breaks through. It's I remember it turns Google that shit. Troposphere? Yeah, troposphere. troposphere. There you go. Yeah. You go. Then it does turn into it does look like just like water vapor, right? It's weird. Yeah. Yeah. Albertans would be familiar with that. Like when if you were in Edmonton this summer and you had that morning where we had the red sky, that's like a traditional big burn in We literally had yeah, <clears throat> depending on what or even B C We had one unique day where it was very red. We had yeah. smoky all summer. Well but, depending on where you were, like there was places where people were sending me text messages at like four in the afternoon where it literally looks like midnight. Like you can't see your hand in front of your face. Mm-hmm. It's so black. And it was a sunny day. It wasn't a cloudy day until the smoke rolled through and it actually blotted out the sun in like in a wild fashion. But like that's, we're talking about the same level of like amount of fire and just like chaos, right? That was our new normal this summer. Yeah. Yeah. That might be our new normal coming up. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so anyways, this, so this Marysville situation. So you guys were going in, I'm guessing that your game plan was to, was to do a uh, backburn because that's the that's the yeah. go-to right yeah so we are heading out to marysville it's about a town of about 500 people and there's actually another department that works there as well so we we're going to meet up with them and the one thing about australia that's different than canada is everyone and their dog and their mother volunteer for this thing called the country fire authority mm. so they're just like millions of volunteers which is really good in times of need but a lot of them aren't super trained right but we we're meeting up with some of these people as well so also, there was no briefing. I didn't really have a lot of instructions what was going to happen. We were just, we went to the town. There's like this main hill before you get into the town and we all stopped there. Mm-hmm. And the main guy that was leading us, he was a forester. Him and one other guy drove into Marysville and disappeared. Mm. And they're going to figure out if we can go fight this fire or not. So we're standing there. Um, you know, a bunch of people are smokers there. So people were smoking, watching this huge giant cloud <laughs> come out of the come out of the distance or above the canopy like we can't really see what's going on Mm -hmm. and it's so thick it's like actually blotting out the sun so it's only like three or four o'clock but like it's almost it's turning into dark time yeah so he comes back and they're like we're gonna go fight this thing like hey sweet let's go do what we can do so we get into our vehicles and we drive in and the first thing we see is like this car crushed with like i think it was a woman and her kid in it and like this guy in like shorts like trying to like chainsaw this tree off this crushed vehicle oh jesus so we stopped and we're like we're going to do something like, no, let's go try and stop this fire at the top of this town up on this King's road. And that was kind of the main, it was up another hill and it was, you guys were told that you guys were told that that there was like help coming for them and that your guys' job was, I don't really know if they said helps coming. They just said, you said something in the book. I think it was like, there's other resources or something. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, Like go up and figure out this fire. Mm -hmm. So then we got up to this road. Um, one thing that I was surprised is like, I thought everyone would be leaving the town, mm-hmm. but people weren't leaving their homes. I wonder what that is. It's just a it's a diff, it's a different mentality. It's called like the the home is your castle mentality. No one can force you to leave. Mm-hmm. And so when I got there, we lined up on the street where we're going to do this back burn to stop to burn off the fuel towards the main fire to cut off from the town. And like there's like a fat like a a woman who is pregnant and like a some like middle aged guy and like flip flops and like a hose that wasn't running like drinking a beer like standing behind me in the lawn. (laughs) Meanwhile, there's like a giant fire within like what how how far away is it from you guys? It's within half an hour. So it's like hundreds of yards. Like we're not we're not talking like kilometers away. Like it's it's like you could feel the heat almost probably. But they've only been looking at this thing for a few hours. Actually, from where we were, you couldn't see the main fire yet. No, okay. No. So, so like it, yeah, you, they were you, in this. You like, could see yeah. the smoke, but you couldn't really see anything. So you couldn't really judge how far it was away. Okay, so for them, they're just like the emergency crews are here. 
they're going to protect us. They're going to take care of me. Like everything's okay. Why not? And, right. There's a bunch yeah. of like emergency responders outside your house. Like you probably yeah. think you're fine. No one's telling them to leave. Like, right. so is there no mandatory? I know there's no mandatory. Uh, there, th- there is now. Right. When, or there is after that fire, but then there wasn't anything. You could do whatever you want. So was there at the time, was there a, like a call, like a radio call being like, it would be wise to va- evacuate the or fire had knocked out the hydro and electricity. So no one had any, um, so there's no communication. There's no communications. Yeah. So you couldn't get anything on your cell phone. There's nothing on TV or radio. That's the scariest and, thing. And no one had water either. So no one knew what was going on. Like including myself really, I didn't, wasn't really told what was going on. Or I didn't have like a bigger picture. They're, they don't use helicopters like we do. So there wasn't like someone in the sky, like telling us what was happening. Um, it was all just on the ground level. Like mm-hmm. I think it, uh, a tower might've called it in or something like who knows? Like we were, yeah. we were pretty blind anyway. And compared really, to how we were really hilly ter- uh, terrain around there too. Oh yeah. Like we like, take helicopters for granted in Alberta. Like we never had that there. Like we mm-hmm. had no eyes in the sky. Yeah. You always have someone flying above you watching stuff. Mm-hmm. Really useful. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's just a fascinating to, to think that like that lack of communication is key, right? Like that's, that's the main thing that require even like, amongst firefighters right if you don't yeah. have that communication then how are you supposed to understand what's going on and it sounds like well we didn't we didn't have the communications within ourselves like i didn't uh, even have like a personal radio and it was like right. it just like boiled my blood every time i went to a fire i didn't have a radio because i felt naked with it because in alberta that's like our main thing that we have because well, it's why mandatory i think i think if you don't have yeah, a radio every single you, person is supposed to have a fire uh, in, a radio that's and on if the you line. don't have a, a radio you can work in groups of two as long as you're beside somebody with a radio in australia in in, in here yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, our fire tax, we only give them four radios. Mm. Right. Oh, wow. But you have to be Yeah, within. you can always communicate yeah. here. Mm-hmm. But there are only radios where our truck radios. So one person was supposed to stay at the truck and listen to instructions. And then I don't know how it worked. But like there, there, there was obviously a, a breakdown in communication. Like I didn't, wasn't even briefed. I didn't really know the plan. I was just well, this is told, obviously like, like you can tell that this is a, a drastically different situation from Alberta where it's like a well, like well-funded well like well trained program right there's a lot of funds to put towards this like a lot of resources to put the towards like wildfire fighting right whereas in australia it sounds like there's it's it's not it's not as well funded basically is what it comes down to right so they definitely not they don't don't have the the equipment or the resources to put that towards these problems right so it's it's i can't imagine yeah it's it's a totally different situation the chaos of trying to 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 manage that situation yeah and another reason i think wise too because most of the firefighters were in their 40s or 50s, even some in their 60s, because they work all year round and they also have like trades. Mm. So they've been fighting fire the same way for 30, 40, 50 years, right? So they didn't really, they didn't really evolved as much as Alberta has with like all the money and resources and the, like, the amount of turnover we have. Like our firefighting staff on the ground level in Alberta, anyway, is like pretty young. Mm-hmm. Like we probably average like early 20s, maybe. I would only, say so for sure. They yeah, only stick around for Absolutely. a couple of years. You get a guy for five years, that's pretty crazy. Three years is crazy. Yeah. It seems like three yeah. years is Huge like that's turnover. a vet. Like really, but Alberta, we we have really good training, really good resources, really good funding. Mm. Um, we do have we do have really good uh, like leadership at a higher level to a certain extent, where they've been in like higher incident management roles. Mm-hmm. But as far as Australia, like they've done, they've seen a lot of fire. But at the time, I think there was just they hadn't evolved to like the next step is we had in Alberta because of the the amount of um, oil and gas money we had that was funding. The, the province. We were a rich province for sure. We're Berta money. There. Yeah. Berta. <laughs> what could, uh, what could Alberta learn from Australia? How do they keep firefighters for so long? That's a problem in Alberta. I sometimes kind of wonder about. Well, I remember when we started fighting fires, if we wanted to, we could have worked at, for an oil and gas company and make 200,000 a year with a grade 10 education. Um, not so much anymore. No, definitely, <laughs> definitely not anymore. So like, well, that we, was on the plate back then. Yeah. yeah, but we were doing it because we liked the job, right? Yeah, um, for sure. There, they do they they keep around because they really like the job, but also there isn't a lot of other jobs to go to. So like landing a job there is like winning the lottery. Like you're never going to give that position up. Like remember when I was there, like some of the younger guys were like joking around with like the older guys, like man, why don't you just like die already so I can have like a full time job? Like, <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Like that's how hard it was to get a full time job there. So once they got it, they held on to it, right? Yeah, we definitely take that for granted here. Like I, I know like most of Canada or even most of the states, like there's it's a totally different situation. Alberta, we're just like so resource rich that no one goes without, right? Like no one goes wanting. Really, it's it's unique, and we I definitely don't. I take that for granted for sure. Yeah, yeah. Like me and yeah, what's um, up? Me and Jordan have a mutual friend named Joel Pekatich who is Australian, mm-hmm. and he 
through Jordan got a job in Alberta and he worked with us for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And he said that fighting fire in Alberta was like firefighting with like old cheat codes on, like anything we needed, we got. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Full cheat codes for sure. That's exactly but there is a limit to the game. Like there was like 2015 when we ran completely out of resources. Like, oh yeah, because every single so country was here fighting fire: South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, Mexico, yeah. USA. Well, it's like we were saying before, right? Ran There's out. only so much you can throw at Mother Nature before she just goes, "Ha, that's funny." The game freezes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, too much resources. So, yeah, you're in Marysville. You're starting this backburn up against, right up against. Like you're you're standing in someone's front lawn, basically starting this back burn. It sounds yeah. Like. So there's there's houses behind us, like a row of houses, and we're at the top of this hill. Then there's a road, and then the forest is immediately there. So maybe fifty feet from these houses, maybe not. Okay. And that's where we're lighting off of. Right. So you start lighting this back burn. Yeah. So immediately, within like minutes, um, the one thing for me, like I was, I wasn't a tourist there but i had my camera so i was taking pictures of everything and i actually have a time stamp of everything so i actually have a pretty mm -hmm. good recollection of when it happened mm -hmm. um not so much in my mind but as the the pictures i can recreate yeah. that yeah and within minutes it was like a full invo involved crown fire so that's like the fire went from the ground through all the ladder fuels up the trunks and into the crowns within minutes mm -hmm. and like it was automatically dark and like Obviously, we're so close in the way how hot it was in the indices. The sparks and the embers were going into the backyards of the hoses and onto the hoses. Mm -hmm. So we immediately go back into the back and start like trying to put out these spot fires. But like within minutes, like it's we're overwhelmed. It's too much for us. So basically, do you guys think like I know the fire was coming? Do you think by the time you guys realized you were in trouble, that it was the the main fire had reached you as well? I'm assuming so, right? Like it's well, I was in the back and I was trying to like use my Rayco and put out these fires. And so you're in the like, people's backyards, just putting out spot fires. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm not really having any instructions or, like working with him, but I'm just everyone kind of went off and started like putting out fires by themselves. Yeah. And obviously, looking back, it wasn't like the smartest thing, but the I never really was bothered by smoke too much there. But like it was so oily and it was so thick, I could like barely see. So I, like put on these like stupid goggles, and I had like this mask that I like watered down and put on my face, and I was like trying to figure out what to do. And I went around the other side of the house. And, like, I thought someone maybe have started, like, another back burn on, like, the opposite side of the street. But I th that must have been just, like, the main fire had just arrived in that short amount of time. So it must have been that close. Well, I was going to say, for that, for, for you guys to start a back burn and for it to go immediately wrong, it must have been just right right there, right? So yeah, yeah, definitely. There was something that we couldn't see. And that's just, like, the lack of, um, like, aerial sight that we didn't have. Yeah. So what happened at that point? Um, so then, obviously... I realized something was kind of wrong. We kind of need to regroup and figure out what was to go on. So um, I went back and actually a buddy of mine named Pep was there and he's like, we need to get, you know, the F out of here. I was like, yeah, man, like no doubt. Mm -hmm. So we go back to the main road and like everybody was gone except for like two trucks. So you're, you're, you're sitting amongst some houses that you can only half see because of the like smoke and like char coming past you it's everything's what orange probably i don't imagine it was, it was, like, it was just i've never seen that color before but it was like yeah it was like a dark almost like a dark black yellow yeah like just it, it, it it's like you have a like the worst instagram filter on ever yeah <laughs> and it's and it's 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 still daytime but it's nighttime because it's blacked so dark, out right? yeah yeah for sure so you have a hard time seeing it all you can see is like the forest Actually, on the cover of my book is the picture I took right before when that was happening. I was going to oh, ask, really? is that, I'm like, is that what the cover of the book looks like? So is that's it, that's midday, the cover. Yeah. Wow. That's not nighttime. I'm just looking at it right now. And yeah, that is wild, actually. Yeah. Basically, just everything's black and all you, all you can see is flame. The only reason you can see trees is from like... Shadows the shadow are all black. Yeah. The, yeah. So there's <laughs> one vehicle there and people are piling into it. And there's like five or six people in this truck. Or like it's like a... Maybe it was a Hilux. It was something like that. It was like a smaller truck, but it could only fit four people. But mm -hmm. there was like six people in it already. So I was going to... Peppy dived into the back seat. I was going to dive in with him, but there's like no way I could fit in. So I went to jump on the uh, passenger side lap. I'm just like, man, I'm just going to sit in this guy's lap and get out of here. But like... I, I kind of wasn't thinking... I was obviously like not in panic mode, but in survival mode. And I forgot the driver's side was on the other side. So I actually went to jump on the driver's lap. <laughs> and he kind of like looked at me weird and like pushed me out. And I was just like... I was like, don't worry about it. I'll figure it out. Like, I'm fine. And like they're like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah. And they fucking drove off like into See, the smoke. That's, <laughs> that's the part of the book that really pissed me off was because you were in a situation where you're like, oh, by the way, we're surrounded by wildfire. There really isn't any escape. But this guy and his and the people he was with were just kind of like, they just took you at your word. Like, oh, we'll just leave the Canadian who doesn't know like 
the situation here. Doesn't even know like where he is right now. Like you can't find your way out of Marysville because you've never been here before. I, I, like, I, don't, I don't know why I said that, but I just that's what I said. Well, you 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 don't want to inconvenience them, right? Like you were thinking of. I think you were thinking of like their safety and stuff. And you're like, you don't want to put them at risk for your own sake. You're just kind of like, just get out of here. Like I'll figure it out at that sure. point. And I've been, I've been fighting fires for 10 years at that time. And I always felt like I could get out of situations. Right. So I was probably a bit more like arrogant than I should have been at the time. They must've been the, like the, the, they must've also been feeling that pressure because for them to, to actually leave, well, that's the, not a rational the reason thing. why they were jumping all in one truck is because our truck was on the other side of the road mm-hmm. and all four tires were on fire. So well, like, that's what I'm saying, though, is that... So we were just going to abandon that vehicle. Right. And they know that you don't have another vehicle to get into, but they managed to leave anyways. And that tells me that clearly they're they're not thinking straight either. Like, this is a this is a chaos situation. It, de- it definitely wasn't a group decision for the driver to leave, but no one said anything. No, no. They're just... Everyone's in shock at this point, I think, probably, right? Like, everyone's... Running on no, a no one's ever seen a fire like that before. No, you don't expect to like go to work where you're getting paid probably minimum wage and get like run into a life threatening situation, right? Like this is not this is not standard for wildfire firefighting. No, this doesn't usually. So people happen. are just running on pure instinct, right? right? And there's no there's no like announcement or anything that this is happening. You guys are just everyone's there's, just scrambling getting. No there's one, no radio there's no radios. Call. There's no briefing. There's no nothing. Everyone is just like scrambling to get off this hill. So you went from starting that a back burn, thinking everything is cool. To losing to, all situational awareness. Yeah. And being stuck in nighttime in the middle of the day, surrounded by fire and heat and embers and being in a town you've never been before, not knowing which way to go to get out. <laughs> what was going through your head? Real then? safe. <laughs> there wasn't really a lot going through my head. It was just like, what's the next step? So like, I remember looking around, I didn't see anybody and I just like, man, I don't think I can outrun this fire. And... I'm like, I'm going to go into the house behind me and go into the shower and turn the shower on. And that's like the best thing that I could think of at the time. And none of the water's working. Well, I didn't know that at the time. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. So yeah, that would have been a, that would have been a really uh, hot shower. Yeah. Hot, so dry shower. I was, I was thinking about that. And then like out of nowhere, this guy named Josh in Zeku showed up and he was from Zimbabwe and he was a forester who just started in Australia too. And he mm-hmm. was a forester and this is the first fire that he'd been on. And uh, me and him were buddies because we went to training camp together. Um, grew up in Zimbabwe, so d- definitely a different culture, polygamous family and that kind of stuff. Every fire I... after that must have been a letdown for him. I don't think he did <laughs> fires after that. I think he changed districts after that. I, th- I think he choice. found the town a little bit um, not very cultured, and I think they kind of picked on him because of his heritage a bit. Oh, that's brutal. Yeah, whatever. But me and him were good friends. But like we, um, he's like, what do we do? And I'm like, I don't know, man. And we both looked at the truck and we decided to go for this truck that was on fire. And I made it like halfway, which is only like 30 feet. And I stopped and I'm like, there's no way I'm making it. And I turned back around and I went to go back into the house. But he, because oh, my mind was still the same thing where like the driver's side was on the, yeah, le- or the left side of the vehicle, but it was on the right side. Yep. Yeah. I'm still trying to wrap that around my head. <laughs> but <laughs> Basically, he, they're but, driving on the wrong side of yeah, the road. Yeah. I, he made it to the truck and he actually pulled it towards, like uh, onto the road and towards this me. This is the like, truck where the wheels were on fire. Just yeah, clear. Just, just from the radiant heat, it wasn't that there was something touching. It's just like it was so hot, it caused the, the tires to start on fire. Right. So he drove it down the road. What is to, that temperature? I want to know what the uh, what, what temperature hot. The temperature's do hot. tires spontaneously combust <laughs> from heat, just from like radiant heat. It's yeah. like... It's not a temperature you can live at. That's for sure. It was enough yeah. for like. I he remember went through something. Serious. I looked at his face after, yeah. and like, it's hard to tell, but like his skin was definitely burnt, and like his had, eyes. Oh yeah, say, for, he must have had like some. Boils. His eyes were like super red for sure. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he made it, and I was running when he, when I heard it. I turned around. I ran so fast, my mind wasn't really keeping up with it, and I actually like slammed into the rear door and like fell back onto the ground. And as the ground, I went to pick myself up, and I grabbed the the door handle and it like melted off into my glove. Jeez. But I was able to pull PPE. it open. Where? Oh, I'm super happy I had gloves on. And then, uh, yeah, I got into the truck and we started to drive down the road and I was just like, okay, I think we're good. But like, we couldn't see anything. It looked like we were in a snowstorm, like all the ashes in front of the, the lights. Right. And it's kind of like the, like the star Wars going into hyperspace situation pretty, right? pretty much yeah <laughs> yeah we just see all the all the white lights are just streaking yeah. past you at, and josh's yeah. english totally. isn't the best anyway and this is his first fire so he wasn't saying anything he was just like white knuckle gripped on it and after it must have been less than a minute he stopped the vehicle and i was like why 
the after we stopped. And it's because... You're it, still surrounded by fire. Still surround, still in the yellow, gla- like the haze. You can't even the, see fire. It's just black. It's just pitch black. Right. So I think maybe he doesn't know where we're going, whatever. And then like you look and you could see like a tree had fallen over in front of the, the truck. Uh, so like we can make it down the road. Obviously too hot to get out to saw this thing off. I don't even know if we had a saw in our truck anymore. Like it was one of those... Probably melted. If the hand, handles are melting <laughs> and your wheels are melting yeah, and everything's this, on this fire. This is one of the trucks that didn't have like a... A water tank on the back. It was just like one of those trucks we had to filter people into the fire. So it was actually a pretty useless vehicle, except for our retreat. But as we're stopped there, like sparks and embers are smashing into the window and like coming through the air vents into the truck. And we're like turning off the vents and like we didn't turn off the truck, but we're like, man, we just, our only hope is to ride out this fire in this vehicle. And uh, it's What's, good. What, what, like at this point, so when the embers are starting to come in and you're getting smoke and stuff in the vehicle. And you can't see anything. It's pitch black. What like what what temperature? Like if you had to guess, obviously you don't know. What like what temperature do you think you were dealing with at this point? It was forty degrees that day. Oh just man, it, it was hundreds. Like I was waiting for the windows to bust in from the heat, yeah. and that's. I thought it was like this is the end, my friend, kind of thing. And like there wasn't like a profound epiphany that I had in my head. I just like kept repeating like we effed up. Like Josh, we effed up. We shouldn't be here. Yeah. And he wasn't saying anything. He was just like fixated on whatever he was fixated on. We actually never talked about it after. And uh, so it's starting to get like super hot in this truck. It's starting to feel like an oven. Like I'm having a hard time. So I'm pouring water on my head and pouring on myself to cool myself down, which I guess that's kind of a bad idea because you're creating that water vapor barrier. I don't know. I read somewhere that's a bad idea to do. And then I was in the back seat and I was trying to get the fire blankets out of the back seat, but I couldn't find like the release to get the seat to come forward. So I'm just like reefing on this thing. And like when I get it pride enough now where I can reach down and get the fire blankets, um, one of the big tanker trucks, it's like a three axle truck, like barely missed us. And like, it must've, it must've been speeding away. It was like one of the volunteer trucks and it came after us and it barely missed us and it smashed into the tree and it opened up a path for us to get out. And then we got behind this truck and it turned on the sprinklers and we were able to, um, go like another hundred feet down the road until we saw like this like soccer field. Like it's like an Aussie rules football field. Mm -hmm. And that's where like all the emergency people were and all like the people that were fleeing the town waiting in there. And, um, actually the back of our truck caught on fire, like an air sign deodorant can exploded from some guy's deodorant. (laughs) And so like, um, the guy that's in charge of our crew, he actually drove up the road and like he had his water truck and he put it out. And we were able to so go into exploded the, as you got into the just smells like axe. Oh yeah. Body I remember I was just like, once I got out of that fire and like, I knew that we were going to be okay. Like it was like a weird weight got lifted off my, my body. I just like, I let out this like huge sigh of relief. And like, in, like right after that, I'm like, Josh, I think we're fine. This thing exploded in the back of a truck. Like, no, like <laughs> <laughs> here we just go again. So many emotions. <laughs> oh yeah, man. But then we made it to the field and, there's nothing we so can what's do. So what, what, like, you get so you get away from the main threat of this fire. So you think, and you're in this field. So what? What was? What was the field? The field in my mind, like reading from the book, it sounded like that was that was the control point. That's where that was. That was like the backup point. If things go went wrong, this is where we go, right? That's not what I was told, but that's what that's what happened. What happened for sure? Okay. Um, and yeah, we got there, and there was like dozens of um, like residents there, and there's like some people that were burnt and like some people on oxygen and like dogs are coming in that were like all crispied up and stuff like that. Oh, and, um, all the, all the firefighters were there as well. Yeah. None of the firefighters got hurt or got caught in the fire and we all made it back there and we sat there for 16 hours. What about we, other emergency crews? Anyone no, else? no, emergency, no crews. emergency crews. Uh, in that entire fire, um, like 175 people died. 175. That's in the entire area. 174. Sorry about that town. Uh, 34 people didn't make it out of Marysville. Man. super sad and like i know those people behind me didn't make it out too um i checked into that but uh yeah we had to sit there for people that were in hours. the house the guy the guy yeah and the pregnant lady and, oh that's yeah. so yeah super <sighs> sad super sad i felt guilty about that for a long time but what do you do right well it's yeah no i don't i don't yeah i don't know that i mean you're you're a foreigner in a strange land you have no say in how this is run. You're just kind of following. No, it wasn't my place. I was just, I went there as just like a, a grunt, just as like a worker. But that's got you... a way on you for sure. Like the, just the thought that that was a situation you were in. Right. And that like, you know what I mean? Knowing that those people lost their lives. That's. Yeah, that was tough. You, <sighs> you experienced like, uh, the years here in Alberta where we had like slave Lake and even Fort McMurray. I, I know you did some like mop up on that one. Like, what do you see 
or can you comment on the differences between what happened in Marysville and specifically Fort McMurray, where we actually saw images of people fleeing a town and no one died in Fort McMurray? Like, why is that different here and there? I, th- I think the main, I think there's two reasons I've thought about this a lot. One is um, the indices and like the weather at the time. Like it was 45 degrees, super high winds, eight years of drought. It's not like we're, we've seen that here yet. Like we might, but so it's a wildly volatile situation in Australia right. relative to yeah. Canadian situation. Yeah, and the uh, the home is your your house or the home is your castle mentality, where like people refuse to leave and they're like, we can save this ourselves. Like in Canada, if you're not if when you're asked to leave, if you don't leave, like police will kindly like escort you to or not leave. so kindly depending i guess in yeah. Fort McMurray, they <laughs> saw this thing coming for like three or four days i don't know how many days well, and there but was there evacuations was, too like yeah they, they, yeah. They, yeah they didn't lose communication so like there was it was on the radio that's, and it was that's on, another thing there was yeah. no there was no order to evacuate there's no communications like it just it happened within hours and, and they couldn't sudden, see it over that mountain either like it's their town is at the foot of a bowl no. like but there's another town called king's lake that was actually south and i think like Maybe a hundred people died just in that fire. Oh my too. goodness! So there was there was four hundred fires apparently that was started that day, but it's because like the winds were crazy and just like everything was that dry. We're like nothing. What were the ignition sources? I was there? just gonna ask that. Yeah, I think a lot of it was power lines. So the winds so, were knocking over power lines or trees onto power lines. I think there's maybe one case of arson, but at first they thought it was like mostly arson because Australia has a, a weird problem with arson compared to Canada. Hmm. And uh, I know one is there. I went to this fire once where. Um, they had a mosquito coil and then the mosquito coil. And then when it got to the very end of it, which takes a couple hours to burn, there was an ignition source there and it started a wildfire. So like they're very smart about, I don't know why they start fires there compared to here, but yeah. So we, everyone work maybe, or I don't know. I know like obviously like arson is a, a, a mental health issue, right? Like you, for sure. Like you, there's some sort of release you get from it. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe for work, but a lot of them volunteer, right? So it's not like they're getting paid to do it. Right. Yeah. That's a good point. Right. So yeah, but apparently, yeah, it was all, I think there's only one case of arson. I don't think that actually hurt anybody, but I think it was all just like, um, it, was, it wasn't lightning. It was all like power lines and stuff like that. Yeah. How does that compare to like any other, I, I, I'm sure like you, Matt, and me too, like I've been in some tough situations I wouldn't want to revisit, but like that one compared to every other of your, you know, 20 years of fire, have you seen anything close and in comparison? No. Like what's the closest you've... When I was in Hell Attack, I went to a fire um, in Slave because they were short resources and I couldn't get a hold of anybody. Mm-hmm. And as I was flying back to Manning, I could see Slave Lake burning down. Mm-hmm. So that might have been the closest, but I wasn't in any, any real danger. But well, that Alber- was a crazy day. There was fires mm-hmm. everywhere, right? Like it was. Yeah. Yeah. And I was right, like, Slave Lake's uh, uh, fire center burned down that day, so you couldn't get comms yeah. or anything. So everyone was. Yeah, that was a yeah. wild day. But as far as like you deep, worked that day, I did. Yeah. I was just um, Nickelback. Right. Yeah. You were at Nickelback? What? No, we have a buddy named Nicholson. We just called Nickelback. <laughs> okay. <laughs> He's kind of a Peace River legend, and I was working with him that day. Gosh, like, this right. is a long time ago. That was actually my <laughs> first day on the job on Wildfire. Like, the crews were speeding out on trucks down the dirt road, and I was walking up with a bag on my back. Like, I'm your new rookie. Yeah. May. I forget the day. Yeah. These guys were yeah. ripping out of the base in a truck or something like that. Yeah. It was yeah. really windy that day. Oh, the, the Slave Lake Fire. <laughs> I remember that. I wasn't there. I was, I was fighting Wildfire. Um, I, I was stationed in Slave Lake, but that day I was actually in field school for university. So I wasn't there the day that the fire happened, but I was there the following morning and, uh, like talking to my friends and stuff that were, that were dealing with the situation, you know, post burn. Um, yeah, they said it was like the only thing you can describe it as is a blowtorch. It was a hundred kilometer an hour winds. Were planes on the airport? They were just parked, flipped upside down. Yeah, they're grounded. I don't oh, know if yeah. they flipped upside down, but yeah, I, I imagine like it was 100 kilometer an hour winds, and the, everything was grounded at well, some point in the day. I can't remember what time. Um, but I mean, there's a lot of people I could have on here that would tell this story much more accurately than I would. Like okay. I said, I wasn't there for that day, but from the way they described it, it was as if. God was holding a blowtorch and it was just going through Slave Lake. A good reference for Edmontonians would be like, whenever we reach 90 kilometer an hour winds in the city of Edmonton, the city expects widespread tree damage on top of cars, houses, everything. This was 100, 100 plus with gusts. I think it was 100 would, plus. Yeah. yeah. I, I, so. I, yeah, I wish I, I knew for sure, but it's, it was, it was un, an unstoppable force of nature, right? And, yeah. and that's in the boreal where we don't have oil laden trees and eight years of drought right like we had a a drought which was like 
um, it was you know it was like three or four weeks of no water or something like that but it was it's not eight years of no water yeah. right it's definitely like a lot of it's like very fortunate that no one got hurt in slave like too like that happened pretty fast mm-hmm. there was one there was one loss of life and it was a helicopter pilot bucketing uh, i think two or three days after the fire and he was i think he was just i'm not sure what happened i shouldn't even speak to it but he 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 ended up while he was bucketing from the lake onto somebody's home he ended up uh Crash crashing the ship. and losing his life yeah yeah but it's that was that was the only loss no one actually died in the fire itself and neither in fort mcmurray either i don't think i think um, somebody died from a heart attack when they were leaving oh okay but that's not fire indirectly related. cause yeah. of the fire yeah but i mean we're very fortunate in canada that we have this system of I don't know if it, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's the system that we have, like the, the the funds that we have and the resources we have that go towards firefighting and an emergency system, or if it's just the environment that's not as volatile as like say California or or Australia, right? I'm not sure. I think it's a combination of everything, but we're definitely fortunate that we have well, we have communications and we have all these different ways of getting people to safety and like mandatory evacuations and all that kind of stuff. But it's sad to see that like that situation in Australia it's not like I mean you want to say that yeah they should have learned from that and I'm sure they have now but it's also no. like there's nothing to precedent that how are they supposed to know right it's, no and then and then when and I went, they're underfunded drastically underfunded it's not like here for sure and then when I did go back like it was a definitely huge culture swing in how they treated wildfires like a lot of money got pumped into our town like there was a new um like state-of-the-art center that they built for like all the evacuees mm-hmm. or if another fire it was like the hub of like the the area mm-hmm. And, like, there was, like, very graphic and, like, real commercials, like, on TV or on the radio of, like, leave fire, or, like, you're going to die. And, like, it was, like, a very different thing. Like, and they were forced, like, now people, like, you're forced to leave early. Because I remember I went to a couple big fires and, like, people were all evacuated and, like, they're, like, er- leaving early is the key. And, like, they definitely changed their mentality after that fire. It's yeah. sad that it took something like 174 people dying to Looking change, back but. with, like, now with, say, policy that allows you to force people to leave their homes given the same situation in marysville did you have enough time if there was the ability to force people to evacuate to actually evacuate them out of that town when that fire hit if if if, like the people standing behind me if i would have said like like go to this a safety area that they would have been fine because we were fine there right right so yeah it definitely would have made a difference sure but like who am i to go to some no, yeah, Australia it would be, the, be like, hey, uh, please the leave. police force or something. I didn't really even know what was going on. Like, I didn't even know where the safety area was. Like, you, that's the thing. I think, like, sure, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? That's the thing. People look back and go, like, well, you should have done this. You should have done that. You should have done right. this. You should have done that. And it's like, well, <laughs> yeah, looking back on it, thanks, Captain Hindsight. Like, appreciate yeah, right? the help. <laughs> like, uh, no, I didn't figure that out on my own, obviously, going through the situation. But... Yeah, I mean, you can't. I mean, that's that's the the human condition, so, I guess. Right? Yeah, and I know there's a, a royal commission that was put in by the Commonwealth to like see like what happened and what could be better, and like no one was to blame. Like, so I'm guessing that the like you were saying before that the the wildfire got a lot more resources after this situation happened. Yeah, um, I don't remember Canadians coming, but there was a lot of Americans that came, like a yeah. lot of American like overhead staff that came. Yeah, I'm hoping they got more funding and just more like ability to do their job right, right? Because it sounds like oh, they were. It was what, tw- what were those firefighters supposed to do? I mean, you're you're rocking 300 gallons of water, and you're supposed to protect a town from a fire that's burning through like. Basically, I don't even know if there's anything you could do about it now if you're to redo it, but no, the loss of life can be prevented if people are smarter evacuation, about evacuation. Evacuation, yeah, totally. And I think that's the route that they went. Yeah. And I don't think they've lost very many people since then. But even then, like you look at California and stuff, and I, I'm not sure how their evacuation system is set up. I think I heard like 45 people have died. A lot of oh people more. Have I think died. there's over a hundred who've died in California that's, so that's far, crazy. or they're missing. It's really big. I, I think it's it, more than Marysville already. I, well, I read I can't this that, morning. But. It was over a thousand people missing on account yeah, for it's big. Man, that's amazing. It's a big. It's, year. it's sad. Like it's you don't know what's going on, and it's I I don't know what their their evacuation situation is. But if it's anything like what happened in Slave Lake, it was just it was so much chaos. And where that, do you go? Well, that's the thing. Like I talked to. I talked to quite a few of the people who would have been part of that decision to evacuate, and what they've said is like nobody really knew whose job it was to make that call. Like, is it the mayor? Is it the fire chief? Is it the government fire chief? Is it like who we, who, whose position is it? Right. Mm. And, and then there's just this, there's this reluctance to accept that this is the situation we're in. You know, you, you kind of always think like, Oh, it's not going to happen here. Like we're going to be okay. Like I remember calling my, my wife called me when I was at the time she was just my girlfriend, but she called me, 
when I was in field school the day before Slave Lake burnt. And she she said she was telling me about the smoke and same kind of situation that you were just saying, Harold. It was about you know the embers and the the orange and the, the blotting out the sun, right? And was she in Slave Lake? She was in Slave Lake with her family, and she had called me and she was explaining to me the situation. She's like, "I'm really scared. I don't know what's going on." And I'm like, "It's okay. The like, it'll be okay." Like before this, we didn't have this, right? This wasn't this wasn't a concern. No one really thought that the town was going to burn. And I was telling her the day before that everything will be fine. Like, it's okay. There's lots of resources. There's always, like, they know how to handle this. It's okay. And they'll evacuate if they had to, right? And then she called me that morning as the fire was acting on the town. And it was, she she called me and she said that the there was a, a building downtown. It was, a, like, a liquor store and a bar and a bunch of stuff called the zoo. And it was she called me she's like it's on fire it's the middle of town it's nowhere near the fire like it's it's actually on the opposite side of the fire but it was it's a it's an old wooden cured building right and she's like it's on fire somebody like started that fire and, and then then i realized that like okay we're in a real situation here because there's embers crossing and lighting stuff on fire and it's and then everything all hell broke loose right but it was mm-hmm. even myself it was that reluctance to accept that and i was in, in contact with with friends who were fighting that fire Right. And even them, they're just like, oh, no, like we're okay. But all of a sudden, that next morning, when that wind was coming and everything changed just in a second, and they were all, everything was screwed. There was nothing to be done. Right. And it wasn't like they could have done anything the day before to stop it. It just, it was, it was going to happen. If you actually look at, uh, if you plot all the historical fires, you can get the data online free mm-hmm. from the government. You plot all the fires in Alberta on a map through history that we have. Mm-hmm. There's like a wind anomaly in that region that happens every few years on some like cycle. We're coming from the Swan Hills area over that like high rise in the topography in Alberta. Like during and spring dip. During spring dip and with that large lake there with the cool like water, there's every once in a while, every few years, a big strong wind just like comes in, boom. And if you look at the uh, fire shapes, historical, they're long, long, skinny cigar shaped fires all pointing towards the lake. Mm. And there's a few that actually come short of the town back through time that never got to a slave lake. But then you see the year slave oh. lake hit. And that cigar is just like, a sh- it, it starts and it just hits the water. Oh. It's short. But there's some that are like super long and skinny. It's incredible. You can see this. And the pattern exists right there. Mm-hmm. Always shooting at the town or nearby. It's like, I've there have been shots off the barge for a long time. Just people mm-hmm. hadn't really picked up on the pattern or I don't know. It wasn't even that. It's, it now. it's like I was saying before, I think. Like, this is just hearsay. But I mean, I think it's just that reluctance to accept that like it's going to happen here. Because we had, I remember even yeah. in my recollection, there was... There was two different fires. There was the Mitsu fire in 1998, which I think was, I think it was about 10 kilometers from town. And I recall it. I recall the the haze and the embers falling on town, getting out, it kicked the, getting out of school because of this fire coming towards town. And then uh, Chisholm fire in 2001. Mm. I remember that one. The same thing. It was it, that one was only. I think well, I think that one was 10 kilometers from town. The Mitsu was 30 or something. It was a ways. Was that the one in the Crow's Nest Pass? No. Chisholm, no. Is that in the Swan Hills? Chisholm, Chisholm is a town just uh, southeast of Slay Lake. Okay. Yeah. Kind of like towards Athabasca is where that's, that one started. Chisholm oh, okay. Fire. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Anyways. Um, but yeah, I always, I always thought that, that that Slave Lake had weird, just the, the giant, the big size of the lake created some weird weather anomalies. Look but, at the polygons yeah. of, of the fires through history there. You'll see it. Yeah. yeah I, I think that that actually speaks towards like... Um, maybe uh, how you're saying like in Australia, they don't have a perspective of overhead. They don't fly. So nobody has this like lay of the land or like large scale fire, you know, view of like what they look like from above. Cause they're always on the ground. So their perspective is always like from the trees below. But in Alberta, we really see a lot from the air. We really understand like the whole overhead view. Well, not just that. We're flying photography during that. We're flying. Yeah. We have so many airplanes, so but- much communication, like to like, I mean, every airplane could talk to God, like you and me on the ground fighting the fire individually if they wanted to. Sure, right? but even in access. real time, yeah. you and me on the ground, we would have arrived at that fire. Mm-hmm. And what would have been the first thing we would have done? We would have circled it mm-hmm. 10 times before we landed mm-hmm. and wrote the white, you know, sent in the white message and, and then landed and gone and fought it. There, there, you drove in. You never saw it from the air ever. No. Yeah. So, so you, you just, never, you didn't know how far back it was. You didn't know how big the head fire was. Like how like, big. Like even now in my head, like I can't picture what it's like around the town because i've never seen it from the sky right? ever 
Uh, I can't imagine that here. That's just not the way we... See. Everything you see yeah. here, you see the whole thing. We're spoiled here. We really are spoiled yeah. here. Like, the resources that we have that go towards this kind of wildfire fire defending is just... It's it's wild. Like, it's... it. Uh, we, we think that it's the norm, but it really isn't. No, and I'm, I'm biased because I've been in Alberta for so long, but we definitely have the best trained and the, the best finance and resource and education for, of any wildland firefighters It all in comes the world. down to money. It all comes down to money in the end, right? So we're the, basically, basically, that, basically what you just that, said that, is... That's definitely like a big... Perhaps, but that gets limited too. That, you that can't run out of resources. But I do know like Alberta firefighters and like the people that run it and the people we have in their organization, we have some very passionate people, mm-hmm. but we definitely have like the avenues to pursue um, being better firefighters that a lot of people, a lot of countries don't have. For sure. No, we, right. we have the means to pull it off, but yeah, I think that historical wildfire data is like another perspective that sort of, you know, we can, we have the ability here now to see these patterns on the landscape by looking at them and analyzing our forests you know mm. fire history and fuel i mean we met we analyze everything now mm. digitally here everything's modeled it's all modeled everything, and yeah. we, we have all the fuels inventory fuel types and, and yeah, we, yeah the we whole province is mapped we've got lidar of the whole province yeah. rich data so you know we have this ability to see it from this perspective again mm-hmm. like from the air mm-hmm. on a computer screen yeah and well yeah there's just there's a lot more management going on sure we're lucky here for sure um yeah so um I had one question I thought of. I've, I've always wondered from the book I wanted to throw at you. Sure. Um, at one point in the book, you kind of like fantasize about what it would be like to firefight with someone you love in your life. Did you ever get to do that? And like, <laughs> did you ever get to fulfill that sort yes, of for yourself? I did. My. <laughs> My fiance now, she actually worked with me for two years on uh, a unit crew that I'm, well, I just finished up. But yeah, I got to do that for two years with um, my girlfriend at the time, but now we're engaged and I'm very, very happy with the life that we have now. But yeah, it was nice being with someone on the line and like spending every day with that person. And, mm-hmm. you know, like there was a couple of times where, um, you know, Kelsey was put in some very um, dangerous situations and yeah, you definitely have to deal with that stress. But yeah, I definitely... I'm blessed to have somebody that got to share that part of my life with me. Yeah. Cool. It's an amazing book, man. Like it's, it really is. I, I, I really thought you, like I was saying before at the beginning, you captured like the essence of what it is to be like a firefighter and kind of like just kind of setting up that whole situation. And it was, it was, like I said, the biggest thing that resonated with, with me was not the actual event itself, like the fire event. It was the post, like the, just the camaraderie and the family and the just kind of the way the mentality going into that and the exhaustion and how that brings out just these interesting characters and people. Right. Thanks. I'm I'm glad you liked it. Like writing this book took me four years and anyone who writes a book like props, like it's, I want to say fighting a fire is hard, but getting a book published is. (laughs) (laughs) Do you have any more in the works? Yeah. I'm, I'm writing a book called the unit. I might change it. Um, depending on whatever. But yeah, I'm writing about um, after Slave Lake burned down, one of the things the government wanted was higher trained crews that were specialized in fighting large fires. And they mimicked the BC unit crew program where there's 20 people um, together fighting large fires. And me, actually you and me both started that program. And yeah, I'm writing about the first few years of the unit crew and how um, we fought the floods in Southern Alberta. Um, mm-hmm. Some pretty um, gnarly fires over the years. So yeah, I'm, I'm writing a book on that. I'm almost done, but as my last book taught me, it, it takes a lot longer than you think. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's a, uh, it's like I said, it's a great book, man. You did a good job. So I think it's, and those, those unit crews were wildly successful. Like it was, it was interesting. I remember when they first decided to do a 20 man crew and it's, but like, yeah, they, they seem to be doing like, yeah, there's eight of them now. Yeah. Um, Slave Lake has one. Mm-hmm. Do they have one? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's in Wabasco. P- P- yeah. Peace for peace, peace for Res too. But yeah. Like court for McMurray has one. Peace has two. Yeah. Grand, Grand Prairie. Prairie. Rocky. Yeah. But yeah, they're, they're, it's an interesting because the idea there is that they're sustained action, and it, right? And, and it works too because mm-hmm. in between Hell Attack and unit crew, I worked as a man supervisor where um, I'd work on large fires with our emergency crews. Mm-hmm. And like th- like they're good, but they're emergency crews. They don't train. They're not, um, they don't work together every day. It's not like it's like the job that they do. Um, so these are basically and they come in, They'd come in packs of four or eight and they'd slam a bunch of those together to make a 20 man unit. So these mm-hmm. like units would be, you know, crews that knew each other in groups of four trying to get to know the other groups of four. So they wouldn't work well together yet. They'd, no, there'd remember, be a learning curve. I tried doing that in BC with, uh, I was in charge of like five hell attack crews, mm-hmm. four mans. And like no one wanted to listen to each other because why would you? Yeah. Now when you I order guess. a team, you order like a full football team. 
20 guys. And mm-hmm. that's all they are is trained to fight they these all large work fires. Together. And that was definitely one of the results from Slave Lake is now we have these higher trained crews to fight these large fires. And they're definitely successful. Like there's a lot of It makes there. a difference. We've learned a lot from it. Yeah. It sounds like Australia did too, obviously. But it's just like a, it's a crazy situation to, to, to imagine. Yeah. I just can't imagine being in the situation that you were in, right? Like I don't literally thinking that like you're like it's done that's it this is a write-off like it's it's like i i yeah, yeah i can't fathom what sorry, that sorry mom and like. dad yeah so what do you think um well, let's just wrap it up like do you have any final thoughts any things that like you took from it that you think that like other like wild on firefighters or other people in the profession might want to know about or something that we could learn from that situation yeah definitely the 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 one main thing that I found out when I went there is like firefighting wherever he goes the same, but mm-hmm. it's also vastly different. And you can learn a lot of different things by fighting fires in different countries, different provinces, mm-hmm. um, even in the next district over. Like everyone has, everyone does um, firefighting a little bit different. You can learn a lot from um, these other experiences. And it also like, like, you know, your time in your life is precious. Like a lot of people didn't make it out of that. And definitely it's something that stuck with me. And it's why I kind of wrote the book is to remember what happened and also to learn from it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I, the sad thing is too that this is not this is not going to be a one-off. I don't think. Like judging by the climatic situation across the globe, is that it's these wildfires are only every every professional every every researcher says that these wildfires are only going to get more intense, more common, more standard. Right? They're just going to yeah. Be, these these smoky summers might be the norm. Yeah. And that's it's one thing with Alberta. Like we have a lot of good things, but the one thing that we are lacking is we have a ton of turnover. Like we're getting. Like if you get a third or fourth year firefighter on the line, that's a big deal now. Mm -hmm. So whatever we're doing in the government to keep people from not staying on the job, like someone needs to look into that and make sure that we have these guys that stay for 10, 20 years on the line Mm -hmm. and make that difference because there's not a lot of people left that have experience more than a decade. And I know a few guys. What's making them leave? I know three. I know three people. I know three people. One woman, two dudes. And they're, yeah, like you were saying, right? Like they're yeah, uh, Michelle Wigmore, uh, Sheldon Hool and Mike Turcott. They're the only three yeah. that I could think of that yeah. have been there for decades. And those are invaluable resources. Like yeah. the Alberta government should do everything they can to keep those people. Mm-hmm. And the one thing for me, like why I can't do it for the rest of my life is going up to Peace River. I work 18 days on, three days off. It's eight months a year. Mm-hmm. It's busy. I have no benefits, no pension. I, I, I'm not doing it for the money. I do it because I love the job. But yeah. eventually, like me and my fiance want to have a family. I Mm-hmm. I want to be home for my family. So it's different too, right? So it's not sustainable for a family. Well, that's what, that's what got me out of it. Right. Was that it's just, it was not that you can't do it. Like I know people that yeah. do it yeah, and, and then they have, they have a winter gig that they take care of as well, but it is, it's a, it's a different life. It requires a different, it's, it's not, you know, the standard societal expectation of what a family yeah, is. Right? Different. But then you get crews that work in the States or BC or Australia and they have the means to fight fires on the line and do it as a career into their 60s. Yeah. So there's just a gap there that's missing, but maybe we don't need that Alberta. It seems to be working just fine, but mm-hmm. who knows, maybe with the fires becoming more pressing, there's definitely going to be a lack of experienced firefighters. We're seeing that already, so yeah. maybe that's something we could take away from this too is to look into that. Yeah. Uh, maybe just quickly then you can comment. Uh, I, mean, I was thinking as well, you've got like t- just about 20 years boots on the ground on fires around the world. Um, what have you seen the climate do over that time is it changing well i remember when i first started um i started in 2000 everyone talked about the 98 fire season like everything in bc and alberta burned down Mm -hmm. and then there was a huge gap and now every few years even every year you're hearing about towns and um, these smoky summers and communities being burnt or threatened it just seems to be one of those norms and i'm not calling it climate change or global warming but there's definitely the trend that's happening with this where even Australia, the States, wherever you go, um, you hear about these places like Morocco or Greece, like fires, wildfires, people, we're not building places up. We're going further into the bush. It's just going to be one of those things where we're just going to have to deal with. Mm-hmm. And forestry firefighting, if that's a, a job or a career that you want to do, there's always going to be work for you because that's not going to stop anytime soon. No, of course not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One for the public is just one of those things where just a takeaway is if there's any kind of wildfire heading in your direction, if you can see the smoke and it's starting to blot out the sun, just get out of there. Just don't be there. Don't worry about your house. Yeah, especially yeah. if you... you it's just a thing. And like, people, you're smart. Like, you know if you're living in an area where if a forest fire comes through, it's going to threaten your house or burn it down. Mm-hmm. Just be prepared to leave. Well, this like, is a real... That's the thing. This is yeah. a real likelihood. If you're living in a town that is 
has a wild and urban interface. You're close to any kind of forest area or, or, or even like in California, it's more like shrubland and stuff like that. Like that's you're you're, you're at risk. Right. So like, yeah. this is a real situation that people need to take seriously. And it's not like these people in California or Australia or whatever are dying because people weren't prepared. It's no. because there's only so much you can do to stop it. Mm-hmm. And now that we're living in the forest and that's becoming part of the norm, like those people that are living there just have to realize that you are in that risk of losing your house. Totally. But be, be okay with losing your house. Just don't be okay with losing your life because, yep. you know, one thing you can get back. Losing your stuff is, uh, yeah. Digital it's, era. It's put, just, all your, put all your photos on the cloud. It's just stuff, you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> it's just yeah. stuff. My parents' house burned down a couple of years after the fire just out of, like, random unlucky chance. And we lost all our stuff, right? But it's it's just stuff, man. It's just stuff. It pales in comparison to losing a loved one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. But Be uh, prepared. Yeah. I think Alberta's had the opportunity to learn that yeah, yeah, I think bird is a bird is very good with um like fire smart and education i think i think we're ahead we're of on the top curve. of it for sure yeah, yeah. 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 we're seeing that yeah awesome guys well it was good yeah, yeah thank I, you any final thoughts are we good wrap it up um you should leave us with one really good piece of aussie dialect we should integrate into alberta wildfire that you've learned <laughs> <laughs> well one one they always say no worries about everything and i actually find that's already in canadian dialect that's yeah we say no worries years, all the time is no worries like are you okay with that no worries we'll figure it out i definitely say no worries no worries <laughs> <laughs> no worries mate yeah no can, mate you yeah. can add mate in after yeah. yeah yeah awesome guys well that was awesome thanks a lot yeah it was great thank you thanks matt